Horace Slughorn is a character that is often overlooked and seen as a side character with not much importance. To me, he's much more than that, and maybe I see him that way because he's so intertwined with my favorite character in the series, Tom Riddle or Lord Voldemort. In this video, I'm going to dive deep into Slughorn's character as I explain his entire life. Just to be clear, this is based on the books and a ton of information that Rowling released on his character outside of the books, but this is in no way based on the films. The films are not canon. Now that that's out of the way, let's get started. Horace Eugene Flaccus Slughorn was born on April 28th in the late 19th century or early 20th century. The Slughorn family he was born into was a family that would later be part of the Sacred 28, a list of British families in the Wizarding World that have the purest blood. Most families on the list, including Slughorns, were very wealthy and had a lot of influence, Horace's father being a high-ranking ministry official in the Department of International Cooperation. Horace was fundamentally a good-tempered boy, but his parents were not very fond of him, not because they didn't like him, but simply because they were uninterested in his life. His parents never focused too much on pure-blood beliefs, but they encouraged Horace to embrace their pure-blood superiority. As a kid, he was educated to believe in the value of making friends of the right sort. When Horace went to Hogwarts, he was instantly sorted into Slytherin House. He proved himself to be an outstanding student, and while he did follow his parents' instructions to seek out friends of the right sort, he also befriended several talented Muggleborns. He had his own idea of what the right sort meant, and it was far different from his parents. He was drawn to those whose talents or backgrounds made them in any way distinctive. He got great pleasure in secondhand glory. He was most drawn to those touched by fame or those who might become a celebrity in the future. Even as a boy, he was an embarrassingly loud name dropper and would often refer to the Minister for Magic by his Christian name, happy to imply that his family was closer to the minister than they actually were. In spite of his impressive abilities, his admiration of those who were in the limelight, and his parents' ambitions for him to work at the ministry, he was never drawn to politics. He instead enjoyed being in the shadow of his many high-achieving friends, never with the intention to surpass or to try to get on their level. Deep down, he knew that he did not have what it took to be very successful like his friends, and he realized that he preferred a less taxing and more comfortable existence. When offered the potions job at Hogwarts, he was delighted to accept, having a great flair for teaching and a deep fondness for his old school. He was eventually promoted to head of Slytherin House, which made him a good-tempered and easygoing man. He had weaknesses, however, vanity, snobbery, and a certain lack of judgment when it came to good-looking and talented people, desperate to bring them in as another successful or famous friend. He lacked cruelty and malice, desperate not to tarnish his easygoing reputation. The worst thing that he could be accused of while at Hogwarts was that he favored those students who he found amusing and promising, and ignored those who he saw had no potential for future greatness. Horace created a club while teaching at Hogwarts, which he named the Slug Club, an out-of-hours dining and social club for his selected favorites. Slughorn had a very good eye for picking students who were destined for greatness. Over a 50-year period, numerous members of the Slug Club, hand-picked by him, had amazing careers in fields as diverse as Quidditch, politics, business, and journalism. Unfortunately for Slughorn, one of his very favorite students, a handsome and very talented boy named Tom Riddle, had ambitions that were far removed from the likes of the Ministry or any job that society saw as good. The Transfiguration professor at the time, Albus Dumbledore, warned Slughorn not to be used by Riddle. But Slughorn, secure in his own judgment, brushed off his warnings as paranoia on Dumbledore's part, believing that he had taken an unaccountable dislike to him from the moment that he had met him at the orphanage where he was brought up. During one slug club meeting, he told Riddle that he expected him to rise to be Minister for Magic within the next 20 years, or 15 if he kept sending him pineapple, telling Tom that he had excellent contacts at the Ministry. Thank you for the pineapple, you're quite right, it is my favorite. But how did you know? Intuition. After everyone else left, Tom stayed behind and asked Slughorn for more information about Horcruxes. Slughorn asked if it was for a school project, but deep down, he knew it was not. Riddle pulled his strings, asking him with hesitancy, in a casual tone, and with some careful flattery, praising him over and over again. Being badly manipulated, Slughorn gave in and told Tom how a Horcrux was made. A Horcrux is an object in which a person has concealed part of their soul. One splits one's soul and hides part of it in an object. By doing so, you are protected should you be attacked and your body destroyed. Protected? That part of your soul that is hidden lives on. In other words, you cannot die. Slughorn explained that in order to do so, you must commit the most heinous act. Murder. Yes. Killing rips the soul apart. It is a violation against nature. 
Tom then asked if it was possible to split your soul seven times. Seven? Merlin's beard, Tom. Isn't it bad enough to consider killing one person? To rip the soul into seven pieces? By the end of the conversation, Slughorn began to get worried and made sure that this was all hypothetical. Of course, sir. It'll be absolutely secret. Riddle actually knew what a horcrux was and how to make it. He just approached Slughorn to see what he thought about making multiple horcruxes. Slughorn never knew this, however, and believed that he told Riddle everything he knew about horcruxes, which did not sit right with him. Even after that conversation, Slughorn remained in awe of Tom until he graduated from Hogwarts. Horace was very disappointed to discover that his prized pupil had not only turned down every wonderful job offer made to him, many of which Slughorn himself arranged, but that he vanished, showing no desire to keep in touch with his favorite professor, whom he had shown so much affection for. Slowly, over the ensuing months, Slughorn had to admit to himself that the affection that Tom Riddle had seemed to feel for him might have been a lie. He had been brutally manipulated by a boy he cared for very much, and who he thought would be his greatest protege. Slughorn's guilty feelings of sharing such dangerous magical knowledge with Tom intensified, but he suppressed them more than ever, confiding in no one. Years later, he had another student who he took a serious liking to. Her name was Lily Evans, Harry's mother. He invited her to join the Slug Club and was very surprised to find out that she was muggle-born. He said that she was so talented that he thought she must be pure blood. He found her to be very kind, witty, and a charming student, and he doubted that anyone that met her would not like her. He often told her that he wished that she was in his house, as she was in Gryffindor. Slughorn also had the whole Black family in his house, but he did not have Sirius, who was sorted into Gryffindor. He thought it was a shame that he did not get them all, saying that he wished he'd gotten the set. Some other people invited to the Slug Club were Severus Snape, Gwenog Jones, Gwenog Jones, Captain of the Hollyhead Harpies, and both Lucius and his father, Abraxas Malfoy, though he would cut ties with Lucius and the rest of the Malfoy family after it was revealed that they were Death Eaters. A few years later, a dark wizard of immense power named Lord Voldemort started terrorizing the wizarding world. At first, Slughorn did not recognize the dark wizard as his former pupil. He had never gotten wind of his nickname Voldemort while he was at Hogwarts, and the Tom Riddle that he knew had undergone several physical transformations since the last time that they met. When he finally realized that this frightening wizard was indeed Tom Riddle, Slughorn was horrified. One night, Voldemort came to the school to discuss a teaching post with Dumbledore, and when Slughorn heard that he was there, he hid in his office, frightened that Voldemort would come to see him. Voldemort, however, did not trouble to greet his former potions master, and Slughorn was very relieved, though his relief was very short. When the Wizarding World fell into war, and rumors swirled that Voldemort had somehow made himself immortal, Slughorn was sure it was his fault that Voldemort was invincible after what he had taught him about Horcruxes. Slughorn became ill with guilt and fright. Albus Dumbledore, now headmaster, treated his colleague with a lot of kindness at the time, but this only worsened Slughorn's guilt, reinforcing his determination to never tell a living soul what a dreadful mistake he had made. Luckily, Voldemort made no attempt to seize Hogwarts on his first ascent to power. Slughorn believed correctly that he was safest at Hogwarts, and he did not dare to step outside the protection of the school and Dumbledore. When Voldemort fell at the hands of the infant, Harry Potter, Slughorn was even more excited than most of the wizarding population. He thought that if Voldemort had been killed, then he could not have made a horcrux, meaning that Slughorn was innocent after all. Seeing how much more relieved Slughorn was than everyone else, Dumbledore realized that Slughorn might have shared some dark secrets with Tom Riddle while he was at school. Dumbledore's gentle attempts to question Slughorn, however, caused him to clam up. Slughorn resigned from the post that he had been in for half a century and never looked back. Horace intended to enjoy a delightful retirement, free from the cares of teaching and the burden of guilt and fear that he had felt for years. He moved into his parents' old home where he had grown up. For nearly a decade, Slughorn enjoyed a well-stocked wine cellar and library, paid occasional visits to old members of the Slug Club, and hosted reunion feasts at his home. He missed teaching, however, and occasionally felt a sad chill at the thought that the famous faces of tomorrow were now passing through Hogwarts without the slightest knowledge of who he was. But a decade into Slughorn's retirement, word reached him through his extensive contacts that Lord Voldemort was still alive, although in some disembodied form. This of all news in the world was what Slughorn feared most, for it suggested that his deepest dread had come true, that Voldemort lived on in some fragmented spectral form because his younger self had successfully created one or more horcruxes. Slughorn's retirement now became nothing but fear and anxiety. Sleepless and frightened, he questioned if it had been a good idea to leave Hogwarts, the one place that Voldemort feared because of Dumbledore, who was surely being informed on everything that was going on. 
Shortly after the conclusion of the Triwizard Tournament at Hogwarts, something that Slughorn had been following with rapt attention in the press, the Wizarding World erupted with fresh rumors that Harry Potter had survived the competition under odd circumstances, returning to Hogwarts grounds, clutching the body of a fellow competitor who he claimed had been killed by a reborn Lord Voldemort. While Harry's story was widely dismissed by both the Ministry and the Wizarding Press, Horace Slughorn believed it. Confirmation came three nights later when the Death Eater Corbin Yaxley arrived at Slughorn's house, clearly intending to recruit him or take him by force to Voldemort. Slughorn reacted with speed that was impressive given how slow and fat he had gotten in retirement. Transfiguring himself into an armchair, he successfully evaded Yaxley's detection. Once the Death Eater had left, Slughorn packed a few necessities into a bag, locked up his house, and went on the run. For over a year, Slughorn moved from house to house, often staying in muggle houses and apartments while the owners were away. He refused to stay with friends, who either willingly or under duress might subsequently betray his whereabouts. It was a miserable existence, made even worse by the fact that he did not know precisely what Voldemort wanted from him. He thought it was likely that his old student simply wanted to recruit him to his army, which was still small compared to what it had been at the height of his previous power. In Slughorn's darkest moments, he wondered if Voldemort wanted to kill him to prevent him from telling anyone how he made himself immortal. Though Slughorn's charms and hexes kept him a few steps ahead of the Death Eaters, they were insufficient to keep him concealed from Albus Dumbledore. Dumbledore was not fooled by the disguise that had hoodwinked Yaxley. He asked Slughorn to return to Hogwarts as a teacher, and to entice him, Dumbledore brought along Harry Potter, who to Slughorn was the most famous student Hogwarts had ever seen, and was the son of one of his all-time favorite students, Lily Evans. Slughorn knew what he was doing right away, and told Dumbledore that using Harry to entice him would not work. Slughorn later noticed the ring that Dumbledore was wearing, and he realized that it was Tom Riddle's ring, which made him frown momentarily. But not wanting to give too much away, or even to land on the topic of Voldemort, he quickly changed his expression. When Dumbledore went to use the bathroom, his plan to leave Harry alone with Horace, Slughorn told Harry that he looked a lot like his father, but that he had his mother's eyes. He told Harry that Lily was one of his favorite students, and then told him how he'd wished that he had gotten the set of the Black family, which Harry noted that he sounded a lot like a collector who was outbid at an auction. He then showed Harry a bunch of pictures of famous and successful students he'd had, all of them signed by the student. Harry bummed him out, however, asking if they all knew where to find him, and Slughorn sadly said that he had not been in contact with any of them for the past year while on the run. Although initially resistant, Slughorn could not resist the combined allure of a safe place to stay, and of course, Harry himself, who had a glamour that exceeded even Tom Riddle's. Slughorn suspected that Dumbledore might have a further motive, but he was confident that he could resist Dumbledore's attempts to find out anything that he had told Riddle. He armed himself for this by preparing a fake memory of the night that Riddle asked him about Horcruxes. Slughorn resumed his post as Potions Master at Hogwarts with excitement. He also rebooted the Slug Club and attempted to collect all of the most talented and well-connected students at the time. He had his first meeting on the Hogwarts Express on the way to school. He invited a number of students, including Cormac McLaggen, Lay Zabini, Neville Longbottom, and of course Harry to have lunch with him. Slughorn caught Ginny Weasley casting the very difficult Bat Bogey Hex on the train. He was so impressed that instead of punishing her, he invited her to the Slug Club lunch. As Dumbledore had expected and intended, Slughorn was captivated by Harry Potter, whom he believed to be very talented at potions. Though unknown to Slughorn, Harry had a lot of help using the Half-Blood Prince's book. In his first potions class with Harry, he offered a bottle of liquid luck to the student who could brew the best cauldron of Drought of Living Death. Harry used the Half-Blood Prince book to win. So here we are then, as promised, one vial of Felix Felicis. Horace continued to have slug club meetings, and he ended up kicking Neville out as he showed none of his parents' talent, and he invited Hermione to join, seeing that she was top of their class. Dumbledore showed Harry the altered memory that Slughorn had given him. I don't know anything about such things, and if I did, I wouldn't tell you. And afterwards, he tasked him in finessing the real memory out of Slughorn. Harry's first attempt was disastrous, and ended in Slughorn yelling at him. After that, Slughorn avoided Harry, running out of class before Harry had a chance to go up to him, stopping slug club meetings, and turning in the opposite direction when he saw Harry in the halls. Harry finally succeeded in getting the true memory, using Slughorn's own potion against him, the Liquid Luck. Harry told Slughorn to be brave like his mother, one of Slughorn's favorite students, which finally convinced him to do so. Please, don't think badly of me when you see it. You've no idea what he was like even then. Shortly after that, Dumbledore was killed in the Battle of the Astronomy Tower. The following school year, Hogwarts was taken over by Lord Voldemort himself, with Severus Snape as headmaster, along with the Death Eaters, the Caros, who took over punishment for the students. Yeah, brother and sister, in charge of discipline. 
They like punishment, the Karos. Slughorn was ready for a terrible punishment from Voldemort, but he realized that he had nothing worse in store for him than to remain in his post and teach pure and half-bloods. Slughorn did just that, keeping his profile as low as he dared, though never enforcing the violent discipline advocated by the Karos. Horus went out of his way and attempted to look after the students in his care as best he could. When Voldemort came to the school and the Battle of Hogwarts began, Slughorn led the Slytherins out of the castle into safety. Once in Hogsmeade, however, he helped to rouse and get the villagers together, along with the families of those students who chose to stay and fight. He returned with Charlie Weasley, the two leading the reinforcements at a crucial point in the battle. Toward the end of the fight, Slughorn dueled Voldemort himself, along with McGonagall and Kingsley, the three of them holding him at bay. Slughorn looked into the eyes of the man that he had so much affection for, not seeing an ounce of that boy in him anymore. He knew that this was what he had to do. He had to stop the monster that he believed he had created. He remembered Harry's words, be brave like my mother. He fought on harder than ever, remembering that he killed his other favorite student. He pushed on, being brave like Lily, the woman that never deserved to die. Harry revealed himself moments later and finally put an end to Lord Voldemort. Slughorn's nightmare was finally over. The evil man that he helped create was finally dead. Slughorn's genuine remorse for the damage that he had done in telling Riddle what he wanted to know is proof that he is not, and never was, Death Eater material. A little weak, a little lazy, and certainly snobbish, Slughorn is nevertheless kind-hearted with a fully functional conscience. In his final test, Slughorn revealed himself to be totally opposed to the Dark Arts. When his bravery at the Battle of Hogwarts was publicized, his actions removed much of the stigma that had been attached to Slytherin House for hundreds of years, helping people see that the house was more than just a bunch of bullies and dark wizards. Though now, permanently retired, his portrait has a place of honor in the Slytherin common room. He will forever be a Hogwarts hero. Thanks so much for watching guys, you can follow me on social media, links for that will be in the description. And I want to give a huge shout out to all my patrons listed below. If you want to be listed on my next video, plus a bunch of other rewards, check out my Patreon which is linked down below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you press that subscribe button to help grow the channel. Again thank you so much for watching and look out for more great videos on the way.